Cardiomyopathies are a diverse group of disorders that primarily affect the myocardium, as in this case of idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. A World Health Organization task force has defined cardiomyopathies as heart muscle diseases of unknown cause. By this strict definition, specific heart muscle disorders, such as coronary heart disease, alcoholic heart disease, and cardiac hemochromatosis are not included as cardiomyopathies. The cardiomyopathies are classified as dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which may be either obstructive or non-obstructive, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. For this video presentation, we will discuss these entities in this sequence. Dilated cardiomyopathy is characterized by ventricular enlargement with reduced systolic function. In this anatomic specimen, all four chambers are enlarged. The left ventricular walls are usually normal in thickness, but since the cavity is dilated, the LV mass is increased. In some advanced cases with marked LV dilatation, the walls may appear thinner. Contrast this heart of a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy with the heart of an age-matched patient who died of non-cardiac causes. In patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, 2D and M-mode echo allow precise measurement of chamber dimensions. Left ventricular function can be calculated, and a visual estimate of right ventricular function can be obtained. And 2D echo also allows detection of mural thrombi, which may occur in either the left or right ventricle. This is a parasternal long axis diastolic still frame from a 77-year-old female with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. The left ventricular chamber and the left atrium are enlarged. The left ventricular walls are normal in thickness. This frame was selected because the mitral leaflets are at the point of maximal early opening excursion. Note the two and one half centimeter displacement of the mitral anterior leaflet from the septum. Normally this separation is less than seven millimeters. As left ventricular systolic function deteriorates, the mitral leaflets are displaced further posteriorly. In real time, you will note that LV systolic function is severely reduced. Her ejection fraction was 27%. This is a parasternal short axis view from the same patient at the level of the papillary muscles. The reduction in global systolic function is apparent. Note that the regional wall function may not always be uniformly reduced in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Frequently, the contractility of the basal and mid infralateral wall segments is better preserved than the contraction of the remaining segments. M-mode can be used for chamber measurements and to study valve motion. In this parasternal long axis view, an M-mode cursor has been placed across the right and left ventricles. The RV is enlarged. The left ventricular diastolic dimension is 66 millimeters, and the systolic dimension is also increased, 60 millimeters. The reduced systolic thickening of the septum and posterior wall is evident. The cursor has now been moved to the level of the mitral valve. It is easy to appreciate on the M mode the increased E point 
septal separation, which is 2.2 centimeters. The reduced separation of the mitral leaflets in diastole is due to low output. The cursor now crosses the aortic valve and left atrium. The sweep speed of the M mode has been increased to emphasize the decreased motion of the aortic root and the tapered closure of the aortic cusps, both manifestations of the reduced cardiac output. This 56-year-old male has enlargement of both ventricles. In real time, you will see that both left and right ventricular systolic function are severely depressed. His ejection fraction was 14%. This is an apex down four chamber view from a 54 year old male with dilated cardiomyopathy. In contrast to the previous case, note that the right ventricle is normal in size, despite the huge left ventricle. Right ventricular systolic function is preserved, while the left ventricular ejection fraction was calculated as 10%. Note the marked rocking motion of the heart. The severe uniform reduction in function is also evident in this apical long axis view. This 77 year old male with dilated cardiomyopathy has enlargement of all four chambers. We have selected a 3.75 megahertz transducer and adjusted the gain upward in the ventricle to demarcate the swirling flow. Note the smoke-like echoes which move like a pinwheel in the LV. This swirling pattern is a characteristic of severe low output states. Neural thrombus, with its potential for systemic embolization, is one of the most dreaded complications of dilated cardiomyopathy. If mural thrombus is recognized soon enough, embolism can be prevented by anticoagulant therapy. This is a huge apical thrombus in a 29-year-old male with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. This is an apical short axis view, again demonstrating the large mural thrombus which fills the apex. While 2D echocardiography is used to readily identify the structural and functional abnormalities that are characteristic of dilated cardiomyopathy, Doppler and flow imaging are utilized to delineate hemodynamic derangements. These include valvular regurgitation, determination of pulmonary artery systolic pressure, identification of a characteristic swirling pattern of left ventricular inflow, characterization of diastolic dysfunction, and determination of cardiac output. We will now discuss each of these applications. Significant left ventricular enlargement results in dilatation of the mitral annulus and in malpositioning of the papillary muscles in relationship to the mitral leaflets, resulting in incomplete apposition of the leaflets. 
Hence, some degree of functional mitral regurgitation is present in most patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Since this functional regurgitation tends to respond nicely to afterload reducing agents, it is important to be able to characterize the degree of mitral regurgitation for each patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. We have narrowed the sector to enhance color flow imaging of the regurgitant jet. This patient has moderate regurgitation. The jet fills the lateral portion of the left atrium. This 77-year-old female has an ejection fraction of 27%. Note the jet of mild mitral regurgitation. This patient with dilated cardiomyopathy also has severe reduction in LV function. In this case, mitral regurgitation is severe. The broad color jet nearly fills the left atrium. Tricuspid regurgitation is also found in almost all patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. This patient has severe mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. We are now directing attention to the tricuspid regurgitant jet. In the real time sequence which follows, you will notice that the amount of tricuspid regurgitation is phasic. It lessens with expiration. But with cycles such as this, recorded during inspiration, the mosaic jet fills the enlarged right atrium. Not only is the color flow analysis of tricuspid regurgitation useful for patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, but continuous wave Doppler determination of the TR velocity is also important. This 69-year-old male with dilated cardiomyopathy demonstrates enlargement of all four chambers. His left ventricular ejection fraction is severely reduced at 13% and his right ventricular function appears moderately reduced. A non-imaging Doppler probe was placed at his apex and directed toward the mitral valve. This is the continuous wave Doppler spectrum of mitral regurgitation. The strength of the signals suggests that the regurgitation is of significant degree. The peak velocity is relatively low for MR, being four meters per second. Using the Bernoulli equation, this indicates a 64 millimeter systolic gradient between left ventricle and left atrium. Since his systolic blood pressure was 90 millimeters of mercury, his left atrial pressure is approximately 26 millimeters of mercury. Furthermore, note this gradual rate of increase of the MR velocity, which indicates LV dysfunction with decreased rate of pressure generation. One would now want to determine if the right-sided enlargement and RV dysfunction are due to pulmonary hypertension, secondary to his left-sided findings, or if the RV is simply involved with the myopathic process. This patient had only mild tricuspid regurgitation. A faint, 
but complete envelope of TR was detected with the CW probe. The peak velocity is three meters per second. You will recall from tape number six that by inserting this TR velocity into the Bernoulli equation, we arrive at the systolic gradient between right ventricle and right atrium. Three squared times four, which is 36 millimeters of mercury. Right atrial pressure was estimated to be 14 millimeters of mercury. The right ventricular pressure is found by adding the right atrial pressure to the systolic gradient. 14 plus 36 equals 50 millimeters of mercury. In the absence of pulmonary stenosis, this RV systolic pressure is equal to the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. In this patient who had systemic hypotension with a systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury, this pulmonary artery pressure of 50 millimeters of mercury represents moderate pulmonary hypertension. You will recall that with normal left ventricular size and function, flow through the mitral valve is directed toward the apex, and red color signals promptly fill the left ventricle during the apical examination. With systole, this blood is vigorously ejected through the aortic valve, hence this column of blue on the color flow exam. We have already mentioned that with left ventricular enlargement and reduced function, the mitral apparatus becomes displaced from the septum. In this apex down orientation from a 56-year-old male with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, note that the mitral orifice is oriented toward the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Mitral flow in diastole is directed toward the lateral left ventricle. In real time, in addition to mild mitral regurgitation, you will see that in diastole, boluses of red color inflow swirl along the lateral wall towards the apex and then turn toward the base, becoming encoded in blue. This clockwise swirling pattern of left ventricular filling is typically seen in dilated cardiomyopathy. Abnormal left ventricular filling can be better characterized by pulsed wave Doppler. As we discussed on tape number two, we inspect left ventricular inflow by placing the sample volume near the tips of the mitral leaflets. To review, normal mitral inflow is characterized by two peaks, an early E velocity and a late A velocity. The E velocity is normally greater than the A velocity such that the E to A ratio is greater than one. Normal deceleration time is between 160 and 230 milliseconds. Normal isovolumic relaxation time is less than 90 milliseconds. This 83-year-old female has dilated cardiomyopathy with severely reduced function and an ejection fraction of 19%. A pulsed wave sample volume has been placed at the tips of the mitral leaflets. The pulse wave velocity profile shows a single spike. As is often the case in patients with severe congestive heart failure, this patient was tachycardic. Carotid sinus massage was performed and as the heart rate slowed, the E and A velocities could be clearly distinguished. We currently recognize two different abnormal diastolic patterns. Patients with dilated cardiomyopathy can have either pattern. This is the more common. The A velocity is very prominent compared to the reduced E velocity, and the deceleration slope is prolonged. This is the pattern of abnormal relaxation. 
This dilated cardiomyopathy patient demonstrates an exaggerated abnormal relaxation pattern. His e-velocity is almost non-existent at less than 0.2 meters per second, while his a-velocity is greater than one meter per second. The second type of abnormal diastolic profile is illustrated by this 20-year-old male with dilated cardiomyopathy. The e-velocity is nearly 1.1 meters per second with a small a-velocity. And note that the deceleration slope is steep. Here we are measuring the deceleration time, which is short, 110 milliseconds. We refer to this as a restrictive pattern. It is usually associated with a more symptomatic state and likely indicates a poorer prognosis. It is important to note that dilated cardiomyopathy patients may be converted from one diastolic pattern to another with progression of disease, as well as by altering loading conditions. This patient has an ejection fraction of 10%. As mentioned on previous tapes, 2D and Doppler can be used to calculate cardiac output. For review, the stroke volume is the product of the left ventricular outflow tract time velocity integral and the area of the left ventricular outflow tract. This is an expanded parasternal long axis view from the same patient. The image has been frozen in systole. One caliper has been placed at the junction of the anterior aortic cusp and the septum, and a second caliper has been placed at the junction of the posterior aortic cusp and the anterior mitral leaflet. The left ventricular outflow tract diameter measures 2.27 centimeters. Using the apical long axis format, a pulsed wave sample volume has been placed in the left ventricular outflow tract, just below the aortic valve. This is the corresponding pulsed wave spectrum with a maximum velocity of 0.6 meters per second. The pulsed wave envelope has been traced and the instrument has calculated the time velocity integral. 10.4 centimeters. The left ventricular outflow tract area is the square of the LVOT diameter times 0.785 or 4.04 .04 square centimeters. Multiplying this area times the LVOT TVI yields the stroke volume, 42 cc's. The patient's heart rate was 100 per minute at the time of the Doppler measurements. Multiplying the stroke volume times the heart rate gives us the cardiac output, 4.2 liters per minute. Dividing by the patient's body surface area, 1.89 meters squared, we calculate the cardiac index, which is reduced at 2.2 liters per minute per meter squared. The combined use of 2D, Doppler, and flow imaging provides a comprehensive assessment of structural and functional abnormalities in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Left ventricular ejection fraction is prognostic, while serial assessment of diastolic dysfunction, pulmonary artery pressure, cardiac output, and mitral regurgitation can be used to assess the efficacy of therapeutic interventions. Although far less common than dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is nevertheless a unique disease entity with a fascinating morphologic and pathophysiologic spectrum. Echocardiography has contributed immensely to our understanding of the pathophysiology of this disease entity. The primary pathologic feature is hypertrophy of the ventricles, 
which occurs without an obvious underlying cause, such as hypertension or valvular aortic stenosis. The hypertrophy is often disproportionate rather than concentric. Most commonly, the ventricular septum is hypertrophied to a greater degree than the posterior wall, referred to as asymmetric septal hypertrophy, or ASH. The ventricular chambers are usually small in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A dynamic systolic gradient is a common but not invariable finding. Several different morphologic variants of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are recognized. Two-dimensional echocardiography has provided us with delineation of the full morphologic spectrum, and 2D echo is also excellent for characterizing systolic function. As with other entities, M-mode is useful for measuring chamber and wall dimensions. Furthermore, M-mode provided some of the earliest insights into the pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with demonstration of dynamic obstruction of the LV outflow tract due to systolic anterior motion, abbreviated as SAM, of the mitral valve. The resultant mid-systolic closure of the aortic valve can also be documented with M-mode. In recent years, Doppler echocardiography has permitted non-invasive hemodynamic assessment of the obstructive form, as well as providing a means of characterizing diastolic dysfunction. Flow imaging provides an angiographic-like display which is particularly useful for semi-quantitation of the mitral regurgitation that is almost always present with the obstructive form. Color Doppler is also used to enhance our understanding of the filling profiles associated with the several morphologic variants. We will first display the use of 2D and M mode in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we will then demonstrate the utility of Doppler and flow imaging in this entity. This parasternal long axis view from a 32-year-old male demonstrates the most common morphologic variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with increased thickness of the entire ventricular septum. Note the normal thickness of the posterior wall. Ejection of blood into the outflow tract bordered by the hypertrophied septum creates a venturi effect that sucks the free edge of the mitral leaflets against the septum. This is SAM which is responsible for the dynamic left ventricular outflow tract gradient. This 14-year-old male has an extreme form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and each member of his family had this same appearance. There is tremendous hypertrophy of the ventricular septum compared to only mild hypertrophy of the posterior wall. Note the abnormal texture of the septal myocardium consisting of a highly refractile granular appearance, which is typical for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The left ventricular cavity is small, such that the anterior mitral leaflet abuts the septum in diastole. In systole, systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflets obstructs the left ventricular outflow tract. In real time, pay attention to both the SAM and to the hyperdynamic function with nearly complete cavity obliteration in systole. In parasternal short axis format, the abnormal texture is again apparent. The papillary muscles are mildly hypertrophied. Marked hypertrophy extends from the septum to the anterior wall. The lateral wall is involved to a lesser extent. Curiously, the inferior wall is the least commonly involved in this disease. Midventricular cavity obliteration is evident. This is a parasternal long axis image from a 56-year-old male with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. An M-mode cursor crosses the left ventricle. 
In addition to the cavity dimensions for systolic function calculations, you can appreciate how M-mode allows precise measurement of the thickness of the septum and posterior wall. The cursor now crosses the tips of the mitral leaflets. This is the typical appearance of systolic anterior motion by M-mode. In this case, the obstruction is not as severe as those previously displayed. The mitral leaflets do not fully obliterate the outflow tract in systole. We will now display the spectrum of morphologic presentations of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the most typical appearance. The asymmetric septal hypertrophy in this patient involves the base to a lesser extent than the mid and apical levels. Note the apical cavity obliteration. In apical long axis format, systolic anterior mitral motion is clearly seen to obstruct the LVOT. This is a similar case in apex down orientation. The marked septal hypertrophy is more prominent at the mid-level than at either base or apex. This gives the septum a lemon-shaped appearance. The lateral wall is involved to a lesser extent. The left atrium is moderately enlarged. Now the regional expansion function of the instrument is being used to focus on the SAM. This is a variant with more concentric hypertrophy. Note that the involvement of the lateral wall is as extensive as the septal involvement. In this parasternal long axis view, you will notice the relatively localized bulge in the basal septum. This appearance is most common in elderly patients and is largely due to the sigmoid shape of the senile septum on cross-section. In this case, the basal septal hypertrophy is associated with outflow tract obstruction as evidenced by the systolic anterior motion. Apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an unusual form, first described by Japanese investigators. These patients have a typical ECG pattern, illustrated here by a tracing from a 64-year-old male. Note the deep T-wave inversions in the precordial leads. On 2D examination, Hypertrophy either exclusively or predominantly involves the apex. It is important to properly adjust the gain settings to delineate this abnormality. The hypertrophy creates a narrow apical cavity, which gives the left ventricle this characteristic ace of spades appearance. Having described 2D findings for the various morphologic forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we will next turn our attention to the use of Doppler in this disease entity. For patients with the obstructive variety of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the site of intraventricular obstruction is verified by pulse Doppler or color flow imaging.
and the severity is determined by continuous wave Doppler. Not only is the gradient measured in the resting state, but also the Doppler exam can be used to determine the response of the gradient to various maneuvers and drugs. Mitral regurgitation is commonly found in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We use flow imaging to semi-quantitate the severity. Doppler echocardiography is also used to analyze diastolic function in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is an apex down long axis view from a 62-year-old female with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Note the septal hypertrophy and the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. She has mild obstruction in the resting state. The mitral valve does not completely abut the septum. The left atrium is moderately enlarged. Pulse wave scanning will be used to verify the site of obstruction. For this examination, the small 2D image is displayed with apex up orientation. We begin with the sample volume at the apex. The systolic velocity is 0.4 meters per second. Now the proximal portion of the sample volume has reached the level of the systolic anterior motion. The systolic velocity increases to 1.2 meters per second. Finally, the entire sample volume has been moved to a level just beyond the SAM. The systolic velocity has accelerated to 1.6 meters per second. We will now demonstrate this pulsed wave scan in real time, and you will both see and hear the velocity increase as the sample volume reaches the site of obstruction. This 16-year-old male has severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Systolic anterior motion completely obstructs the LVOT in this frame. Color flow imaging quickly verifies the level of obstruction, which is identified as the site where color aliasing begins. The severity of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is determined with continuous wave Doppler. Signals are usually delineated best from an apical transducer location, although occasionally other locations, such as left parasternal, also yield a clearly defined envelope. Since from an apical transducer position, the velocity of intraventricular obstruction, as well as mitral regurgitation, are directed away from the transducer, and are systolic in timing, occasionally these can be mistaken for each other. Therefore, some attention to detail is necessary to avoid confusion. Dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction has a characteristic appearance. The peak is delayed, such that the CW spectrum is dagger-shaped. In this case, the maximum velocity is 4.2 meters per second. Using the Bernoulli equation, this calculates to a maximum instantaneous gradient of about 70 millimeters of mercury. Note this gap from the end of the ejection to the onset of mitral flow, which is the isovolumic relaxation period. By identifying this, we can be certain that this velocity spectrum is occurring during the ejection period and is therefore the velocity of obstruction. This CW recording is also from a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy 
using an apical transducer location. The peak systolic velocity is 7 meters per second. However, this is not the spectrum representing obstruction. Note that there are no gaps at the isovolumic periods. This spectrum is holosystolic and therefore must represent mitral regurgitation. Identification of the isovolumic periods is critical in correctly identifying the spectrum representing obstruction for gradient calculation. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by a gradient that is dynamic. This dynamic feature can be nicely demonstrated in the non-invasive laboratory using continuous wave Doppler. This sequence illustrates how the gradient can be manipulated. In the resting state, the peak velocity is 2.1 meters per second, which calculates to a gradient of 18 millimeters of mercury. Next, the patient performs a Valsalva maneuver and the velocity increases to 4.5 meters per second, which is a gradient of 81 millimeters of mercury. Finally, we have the patient inhale amyl nitrite, and the gradient increases to 121 millimeters of mercury. This patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a spectrum representing obstruction per second in the resting state. The calibrations here are 0.5 meters per second. With Valsalva, the spectrum briefly disappears and then reappears with an increased velocity of 5.5 meters per second, which is a peak gradient of 121 millimeters of mercury. We will now play the entire sequence in real time. Dr. Sasson and the group at Stanford have studied hundreds of cardiac cycles from five patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who underwent catheterization simultaneously with Doppler measurement of the LVOT velocity. Their results show an excellent correlation between the non-invasive Doppler gradient and the invasively determined gradient with an R value of 0.96 and a standard error of the estimate of 3.9 millimeters of mercury. For patients with a high degree of obstruction in the basal state, or for patients whose symptoms persist despite medical therapy, we recommend partial septal myotomy myectomy. This surgical procedure relieves outflow obstruction and provides excellent relief of symptoms. Postoperatively, Doppler evaluation allows us to non-invasively assess the degree to which the obstruction has been reduced. This CW spectrum is from a 29-year-old male who is seven years post myotomy myectomy. Prior to surgery, we measured a 94 millimeter outflow tract gradient. Now, postoperatively, his LVOT velocity is 1.2 meters per second which is normal. Both the isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation periods are evident. <laughs> Color flow imaging can be used to semi-quantitate the degree of mitral regurgitation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In this case, the 2D exam clearly demonstrates LVOT obstruction. The sector has been narrowed to enhance flow imaging. The mosaic signals in the outflow tract are due to the high degree of obstruction. Mild mitral regurgitation is evident. The jet is directed posterolaterally. <laughs> <laughs> 
This is a parasternal long axis view from a five-year-old child with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Once again, the mosaic pattern in the LVOT identifies obstruction. A broad jet of mitral regurgitation tracks along the atrial surface of the posterior mitral leaflet. The regurgitation is moderate in severity. The semi-quantitation of mitral regurgitation can be made both in the baseline state and following maneuvers or drugs. This latter is particularly useful for patients being considered for septal myotomy myectomy. It is important to determine whether their mitral regurgitation greatly diminishes with manipulations that reduce the outflow obstruction. If so, the regurgitation is due to obstruction and therefore is expected to be diminished or completely abolished with surgical relief of obstruction. This apical long axis view demonstrates left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The gradient was 100 millimeters of mercury by CW Doppler exam. The obstruction is identified by the mosaic pattern in the LVOT. A jet of severe mitral regurgitation fills the left atrium. In most cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mitral regurgitation is a consequence of systolic anterior motion. Initial rapid ejection results in a venturi effect, which sucks the mitral apparatus toward the septum. This systolic anterior motion leads to abnormal mitral coaptation with resultant mitral regurgitation. This sequence, eject, obstruct, leak, was initially proposed by Dr. Weigel at the University of Toronto based on analysis of left ventriculograms. This sequence of events was verified by Dr. Nishimura using color flow imaging. In this diastolic frame, mitral inflow is encoded in red. Now, in early systole, a laminar pattern of ejection is noted. There is uniform blue with color aliasing. The ECG cursor indicates that we are at mid-systole. Obstruction is denoted by the mosaic pattern in the LVOT. Now the ECG cursor is at the T wave. In late systole, a jet of MR is clearly defined. Color M mode can also be used for precise timing of these systolic events in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. The 2D image is in parasternal short axis orientation. The M mode cursor crosses the LVOT and the left atrium. This is the resultant color M mode, mitral valve, LVOT, and left atrium. In early systole, the uniform blue indicates laminar ejection, which is followed by the mosaic pattern of obstruction, which is followed by the mosaic pattern of mitral regurgitation in the left atrium. Of course, we know from CW analysis that the mitral regurgitation is actually holosystolic even though the greatest volume of regurgitation occurs in mid to late systole. As our instruments have become more sensitive, we are able to detect the weaker early signals of MR, as well as the strong signals of the fully developed jet later in systole. In this case, we have captured a cardiac cycle on the instrument's cine loop. We can then use the trackball to select frames at points throughout the cardiac cycle. Here, we are in early systole, and the red signals are typical for laminar ejection. Note the faint jet of mitral regurgitation. With obstruction, indicated by the mosaic pattern, 
the MR signals become more prominent. A small mosaic jet is seen in the left atrium. We have now moved to late systole. The turbulent jet of mitral regurgitation is fully developed. Up to this point, we have been discussing systolic aberrations of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but this is also a disease of diastole. The massive hypertrophy leads to marked diastolic dysfunction. As with dilated cardiomyopathy, we currently recognize two types of abnormal diastolic patterns. This is the most common, the pattern of abnormal relaxation. The E velocity is reduced and the A velocity is increased such that the E to A ratio is much less than one. The deceleration time is prolonged. Not displayed here is the isovolumic relaxation time, which was also prolonged. In contrast, this patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a restrictive pattern of left ventricular inflow. The sample volume is at the tip of the mitral leaflets. The E to A ratio is increased, and the deceleration time is 160 milliseconds. As previously mentioned, this restrictive pattern is usually found in patients who are the most symptomatic. When characterizing diastolic function of the left ventricle, we also sample left atrial inflow from the pulmonary veins. This spectrum was obtained from the right paraseptal pulmonary vein of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The systolic and diastolic velocities appear normal. However, note that there is a very prominent flow reversal of 0.4 meters per second in the pulmonary vein following atrial systole. This is indicative of abnormal diastolic filling. Sampling pulmonary venous flow is particularly useful in cases of suspected diastolic dysfunction when the mitral flow profile appears normal. This spectrum was obtained from a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy using a CW transducer at the apex. It illustrates a typical feature of this disorder first described by Dr. Hatley. This is the E velocity which is reduced. The A velocity is accentuated. Hence, the pattern is that of abnormal relaxation. This large velocity spike of two meters per second occurs between the end of ejection and the onset of mitral flow. That is, it occurs during the isovolumic relaxation time. With hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the apex relaxes before the base. This results in displacement of the end systolic volume of blood toward the apex. It is the velocity of this displacement which we record by Doppler during isovolumic relaxation. This IVRT signal, therefore, is a manifestation of dyssynchronous relaxation. You must be careful not to mistake this signal for the E velocity. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a unique disease entity. 2D and Doppler with flow imaging provide a comprehensive, non-invasive assessment of patients with this disorder, allowing complete definition of morphology, ventricular function, and abnormal hemodynamics, both systolic and diastolic. When assessing patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, catheterization is rarely indicated. When invasive study is required, it is usually to define coronary anatomy. This parasternal long axis view from a 10-year-old female shows concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. There is systolic anterior motion of the mitral apparatus, 
Her diagnosis was evident on clinical exam. She has Friedrich's ataxia. This is a specific disorder affecting cardiac muscle, which has a morphologic appearance very similar to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Using 2D and Doppler echo, both, sy both systolic and diastolic function can be followed serially in this disorder. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is far less common than either dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. The term restrictive cardiomyopathy applies to a group of disorders which are similar in pathophysiology, but very likely unrelated in pathogenesis. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is characterized by normal ventricular cavity size, biatrial enlargement, a predominant abnormality of diastolic function, and normal systolic function, at least early in the disease course. Unlike dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, whose definitions are based on morphology, the World Health Organization definition of restrictive cardiomyopathy is based on the hemodynamic derangement. This deviation from a morphologic definition creates confusion when you consider that we have already demonstrated that some patients with either dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathies can have restrictive physiology. Since the ventricles are normal sized with normal wall thickness in the primary form of restrictive cardiomyopathy, we prefer to classify this entity using morphologic terminology, non-dilated, non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The World Health Organization definition of restrictive cardiomyopathy allows identification of three separate entities. A primary form with predominant myocardial fibrosis, endomyocardial fibrosis, and eosinophilic endomyocardial disease. Since endomyocardial fibrosis is a disease found almost exclusively in tropical climates, we in this country do not encounter it. We will therefore focus attention at this time on the primary form and on eosinophilic endomyocardial disease, which is largely limited to temperate climates. This heart is of a 63-year-old female who had restrictive cardiomyopathy, characterized by normal sized left and right ventricles with normal wall thickness and marked by atrial dilatation. The atrial dilatation is a consequence of non-compliant ventricles. The coronary arteries were normal. This 77-year-old male has a primary form of non-dilated, non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The normal-sized ventricles are overshadowed by the huge atria. Ventricular systolic function is normal. These patients frequently have associated mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Here we have narrowed the sector, focusing on the left ventricle and left atrium in order to optimize the jet of moderate mitral regurgitation. We are now directing attention to the right heart and the jet of severe tricuspid regurgitation, which nearly fills the huge right atrium, can be clearly visualized. 
We have, earlier in this tape, described the appearance of restrictive physiology on pulsed wave Doppler examination. This is another patient with the primary form of restrictive cardiomyopathy. The sample volume has been placed in the mitral funnel, just to the atrial side of the tips of the mitral leaflets. As expected, the e-velocity is large, and the deceleration slope is steep, measuring 120 milliseconds. You will notice this signal below the baseline, which precedes the QRS complex. This is diastolic mitral regurgitation. It gives witness to the extreme elevation of left ventricular diastolic pressure. The sample volume is now positioned just to the atrial side of the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid diastolic inflow pattern also shows a prominent e-velocity. This is systolic tricuspid regurgitation. Following deceleration, there is also tricuspid regurgitation in diastole. So we know that the right ventricular diastolic pressure is severely elevated. We characterize left ventricular inflow by placing the sample volume just to the ventricular side of the leaflets but it is also important to scan the atrial side of the atrioventricular valves, searching for diastolic regurgitation. Eosinophilic endomyocardial disease is part of the spectrum of the idiopathic hyper-eosinophilic syndrome, which can result in infiltration of multiple organs. In the heart, the eosinophilic infiltration is myocardial, with particular concentration in the subendocardium. There is resultant subendocardial necrosis, followed by thrombosis, and finally fibrosis. The pathologic process most prominently involves the apices as well as the inflow portion of the ventricles. This is the junction of the left atrium and left ventricle. The characteristic lesion of eosinophilic endomyocardial disease is entrapment of the posterior mitral leaflet by thrombofibrotic material. This apical long axis view is from a 59-year-old female with hypereosinophilic syndrome, demonstrating characteristic 2D echo features of this disorder. This bulge is the thrombofibrotic material, and this is the entrapped posterior mitral leaflet. As you would expect, this entrapment is associated with severe mitral regurgitation. With flow imaging, mosaic signals of severe mitral regurgitation fill the left atrium. The holosystolic signals of severe mitral regurgitation are also evident on color M mode. This apical four chamber view is from a 74 year old male with hyper eosinophilia. In addition to entrapment of the posterior mitral leaflet, Eosinophilic endomyocardial disease also tends to obliterate the apex with thrombus, which eventually becomes fibrotic. As opposed to apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, with eosinophilic endomyocardial disease, there is no longer an apical cavity visualized. The apex is obliterated in diastole as well as in systole.
Apical obliteration is also evident in this apical long axis view. In real time, apical contractility is evident, which distinguishes this entity from apical myocardial infarction with mural thrombus. Cardiac amyloid is classified as a specific disease affecting heart muscle, although its small ventricular chambers, prominent abnormalities of diastolic function, and normal systolic function early in the course certainly make this disease entity very similar to the restrictive cardiomyopathies which we have just discussed. The increased wall thickness associated with cardiac amyloid might be mistaken for hypertrophy. Therefore, it is prudent not to diagnose LVH by echo whenever the wall thickness is increased. Although most commonly the increased wall thickness and mass is secondary to LVH, in certain cases it may be due to infiltration. And therefore, it may be helpful to examine the ECG. Since the increased wall thickness with amyloid is due to deposition of fibrils in the interstitium, rather than to an increase in myocardial mass, the ECG shows low voltage instead of LVH. This discordance between increased wall thickness on the echo and low voltage on the ECG is very useful in differentiating infiltration from hypertrophy. Cardiac amyloidosis is an infiltrative disorder Amyloid fibrils deposit in the interstitium between cardiac myocytes. This infiltration leads to increased thickness of the ventricular walls, as demonstrated in this pathologic specimen. The ventricular chambers are not dilated. The amyloid deposits are in the lighter colored areas within the myocardium. Cardiac amyloidosis has a very characteristic appearance on 2D echo. The ventricular walls are thickened. Note the abnormal texture of the myocardium consisting of a highly refractile granular appearance which is due to the amyloid deposition. Amyloid also deposits in the valves causing them to be slightly thickened. And small to moderate sized pericardial effusions are common with this disorder. The amyloid deposits create a striking, stenciled appearance to the LV image. Systolic function is preserved in this case, although it often deteriorates in advanced stages. In this apical long axis view, the small pericardial effusion is again evident. In this four-chamber subcostal view, the increased thickness of the right ventricular free wall and the atrial septum is nicely demonstrated. This parasternal long axis view from a 41-year-old female is typical for cardiac amyloid with marked increase in thickness of the ventricular septum and posterior wall. The papillary muscles are also thickened and granular in appearance. There is a small pericardial effusion. The left atrium is enlarged. Note the coronary sinus, which is well outlined, and the mitral and aortic valves are thickened. The valvular thickening is due to amyloid deposits. 
In this case, the thickening is associated with mild mitral regurgitation. Although there is no aortic regurgitation in this particular case, we not infrequently identify mild to moderate regurgitation of all four valves in patients with cardiac amyloid. In this case of cardiac amyloid, the pulse wave spectrum shows a restrictive pattern. The E and A velocities are nearly fused, but can be distinguished. The E velocity is one meter per second, while the A velocity is just less than 0.4 meters per second. The deceleration slope is steep. The deceleration time measured 130 milliseconds. This restrictive diastolic profile typically appears in the advanced stage of cardiac amyloidosis. Echocardiography plays a primary role in diagnosis of the various cardiomyopathies. Patients presenting with cardiomegaly on physical exam or chest x-ray and patients presenting with signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure can be immediately categorized according to the morphologic abnormalities on the 2D exam. Systolic function can be readily determined, and Doppler and flow imaging can be used to fully characterize systolic and diastolic hemodynamics, which can then be followed serially through the course of the disease and various therapeutic interventions. 